I read an article about a book that was essentially looking over the results of a 2012 American National Election Survey by a couple of scholars, Yancey and Williamson. Boring. Well, what caught my attention about the article was the title of the book that the article was about. Here's the title. So many Christians, so few lions. This is a scholarly book. What they discovered in this book, in the study, was that prejudice against religion is even more prominent in America than racial prejudice. And the author of the article said, quote, Surprisingly to me, dislike of fundamentalists was even higher than dislike of Muslims. Islamophobia is acknowledged at least as a possibility, but prejudice against conservative Christians doesn't even have a name. Now, lest you think we can take comfort in the fact that as Anglicans we are more evangelical and we are not fundamentalists, don't think for a second a secular person knows the difference. Most Christians don't even know the difference. The second part of this finding was also troubling. This is what they said. Our research confirms the finding of our 2010 study that people who harbor animosity towards conservative Christians hold relatively high levels of social power. Now, to prove the point, they quoted some of the people who responded to the survey. Restrict their ability to become judges, senators, representatives, members of cabinet, military chief and staff, and other powerful members of a government, said a man over 75 with a bachelor's degree. Should not be able to make decisions regarding the law. They should somehow have to be supervised if they are working with other people, said a woman under 45 with a master's degree. Now, they're talking about conservative Christians here. We should put in place mandatory extreme prison sentences for anyone or any group that attempts to take away civil liberties guaranteed by the Constitution. You know what that was about, said a middle-aged man with a master's degree. Churches should not be allowed to provide orphanages and adoption programs, said an elderly man with a doctorate. I think we should restrict the indoctrination of children in religious dogma and ritual, said a middle-aged man with a master's degree. Conservative Christians should not be allowed to hold political office, be police, serve in the armed forces, said another middle-aged man with a doctorate. So here's the good news. If you've been feeling like your faith is under attack recently, you ain't paranoid. But I've got some even better news. I think our lessons today profoundly diagnose the problem, tell us what we're to do about it, and actually give us hope. I think even more than hope. But let's look at how it diagnoses the problem. I'm going to do something I've never done before, and I'm going to actually preach in part from the Apocrypha. Now, before you run out of the building and call the bishop and say Ray is in heresy, let me explain. Anglicanism holds the Apocrypha as deuterocanonical, meaning next to canon. We find them edifying writings that are close to Scripture, but they are not the inspired Word of God. That's why when Mark finished the lesson, he didn't say the word of the Lord. He said, here ends the reading. That said, because these are ancient and edifying texts, while we are not allowed to draw doctrine from them, we can turn for them to the wisdom they offer us, just like you would the church fathers or a modern theologian or Jerry Springer. Now, consider how well this book of wisdom diagnoses the problem. Why the animosity towards Christians? In part, we need to admit some of it's our fault because we've been pretty poor examples. But the text shows us it's not just us. Listen again to what it says in Wisdom. The wicked say, Let us lie in wait for the righteous man because he is inconvenient to us and opposes our actions. He reproaches us for sins. The very sight of him is a burden to us because his manner of life is not like ours and his ways are strange. Translation, we wicked people would be much happier if you Christians weren't around to remind us of our wickedness. They want to quote W.C. Fields. Go away, boy, you're bothering me. But even deeper, they're just being reminded of their sins. The wicked are troubled by the righteous because they challenge them and even in some cases cause them the worry that they just might be living a lie. The text says, for they reasoned unsoundly, saying to themselves, Short and sorrowful is our life, and there's no remedy when life comes to an end. 
and no one has been known to return from Hades. Since they believe this, that there is life is that brief and there's nothing after it, this is what they conclude. Let us take our fill of costly wine and perfumes and let no flowers spring pass us by. Let none of us fail to share in our revelry. Everywhere let us leave signs of our enjoyment. Years ago there was a beer commercial that just captured this sentiment perfectly. You only go around once in life. Y'all remember this one? So grab all the gusto you can. You only go around once in life, so grab all the gusto you can. But what the righteous represents is an attitude that says, that's wrong. We don't only go around once. In fact, this life is actually preparation for life to come, and you need to be prepared because he is coming back to judge the living and the dead. As they see it, they are trying to have a party, and we are the consummate party poopers. I saw an ad that I guess was meant to convince people to buy the product, but boy, it showed me the sheer vanity of this grab all the dust of mentality. New Transporter movie is out, and sadly Jason Statham's not in it, and the Transporter is famous for driving a high-end Audi, so I got curious and I googled, I wonder what his car costs. $130,000 for, for his Audi, right? And that's, you know, but what really caught me, this was a, I found this car in a dealer in Massachusetts. And the ad for the dealer said this, quote, be the envy of every driver in Massachusetts. Now, I went to seminary in Massachusetts. And drivers in Massachusetts are not having envy towards each other. Drivers in Massachusetts only care not to die in a fiery death. That's the only thing they're thinking about. But even beyond that, if, if you're making people envy you your goal, that's sad. How does impressing strangers who are going to forget about you 15 minutes later add debt to your life? God's desire for us is to live lives of meaning. And that's why he warns us that envy is a sin. And so our very presence convicts them that they're headed in the right direction, wrong direction, and they don't want to hear it. That's the diagnosis. What is our response to be? Let's consider what our lessons tell us what we're to do about it. What do we do about this hatred towards Christianity? I take two things from our lessons. First, from the Gospel. Jesus tells us we're to become the servant of all. I think this is how we go about turning the other cheek. It would be all too easy for us as Christians to kind of get this bunker mentality, pull away from the world, and just wait until the Lord comes back. But that's not the answer. Our calling in the face of animosity is to find ways to love and serve the world. Certainly that was Jesus' model. He knew he was going to die in Jerusalem, but he regularly visited Jerusalem, and at one moment he wept for it. Romans 12, 20 puts it this way, If your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. And in doing this, you heap burning coals of shame on their heads. The second thing I think that we're to do, and I take this from James, I heard a parishioner recently say, James is quickly becoming my favorite book, and I'm right there with him as I've been studying it. Such practical wisdom, you could be in this book the rest of your life. But I learned something, or hear something in James here, and, and I know that at first blush, it sounds like James was using some very harsh language towards the church. I mean, after all, he calls the church adulterers. Imagine next month when Bishop Lyons is here and he gets in the pulpit and calls us adulterers. That would kind of ouch a little bit. But rather than being merely just a tongue lashing, I see the apostle making the strongest of declarations. And this is why I think he uses such strong language. He's making the strongest of declarations that while the church must be in the world, the world must must, must not be in the church. We have to be in the world, but the world cannot be in the church. Why? Because we cannot be effective for the kingdom of God if we're continually in conflicts and disputes with one another. We cannot extend the kingdom of God if everyone is wanting their own way, if everyone is envying one another or jealous towards one another. We cannot be the hands and feet of Christ in the world if we're acting like a bowl full of Chinese fighting fish. And so James' counsel is we need to make a decision. He says that friendship with the world puts us at enmity with God. Friendship with the world puts us at enmity with God. Now let's be clear. He is not saying we cannot have friends in the world. He's just saying we cannot have friendship with the world and still be friends of God. We have to make a choice. 
Can't you hear the echo of Jesus here? You cannot serve two masters. You're going to love one or hate the other. You can't do it. You've got to make a choice. And so we have to make a choice to be a friend of God, which means that we reject the values and the standards and the mores of this world. Or probably more accurately, I should say, we reject the lack of values and standards and mores of this world. Now, I, I don't claim to have all the world out of me, but I must confess that this part of Christianity I really enjoy. I love that Christianity at its root is really countercultural, And I don't mind that they think that we're strange. The world is so full of lemmings that I, I actually feel badly for that. Remember years ago, the standard to uphold was zero population growth. We're about to run out of food. We shouldn't have any more kids. We need to stop having them. All the lemmings ran over to that camp to find meaning and value to their life, and maybe this is, will give me some significance, and then we didn't run out of food. And anybody that didn't agree with me, you hate this world. You hate this planet. Then the headline was, you may, some of you may remember this, we have a coming ice age, and it's the fault of hairspray and deodorant killing the ozone layer, and we're going to have an ice age. So what we have to do is all have flat hair and become stinky in order to save the planet. And if you don't become flat hair and stinky, you're a hater. Big people, people with big hair, it smells good, haters. But we didn't have an ice age. Next came the pro-abortion crusade under the guise of women's health and rights, which ironically ignored the health and rights of the unborn child. And Planned Parenthood has shown us where that goes while the lemmings ran to that camp, trying to find significance and meaning. I could go on and on, because about every decade, there is a cause celebre for people to run to, because the world is going to come to an end if we don't do it. And meanwhile, what the Scripture teaches us is Jesus is still on the throne, His Word is sure and true, the Church is spreading His kingdom, and it's a kingdom that will never be shaken. The world is full of lies and angst and chaos, and that's why the world must not be in the Church. We are built on the solid rock of Jesus Christ, who has told us, in the world, you will have much tribulation, but fear not, I have overcome the world. So we shouldn't be surprised by the world's animosity, but we all should not fear it or react to it. Instead, we're called to walk in the Spirit so that we do not fulfill the lust of the flesh. We are to be in the world, but we are not allowed to allow the world to be in the church. Diagnosis, what we're supposed to do, and the third thing I said is that I think that this lesson brings us hope and actually more than hope. And the reason I say that is because there is this jewel of the line, almost buried if you're not careful to catch it, in the midst of James' strong admonition. It comes when he tells us why we cannot be friends with the world. Listen to his words again. God yearns jealously for the spirit he has put in us. We are not to be friends in the world because God yearns jealously with this jealous lead for the spirit he's put in us. The paraphrase of the message says God is a jealous lover. That may be going a little bit too far, but don't miss the point. For many people, it's kind of difficult enough to kind of grasp the fact that God really loves you. But this text takes it a step further. More than loving us, he jealously yearns for us, the text says. That's why I mean this offers us more than hope. That thought is almost overwhelming. What would it do for your prayer life? If rather than getting up in the morning and thinking, well, I better say my prayers so the Lord isn't mad at me, you thought, God is yearning to be with me. Why don't I check it? What if when you got up in the morning, you, you thought about your Bible reading, and instead of thinking, well, I better read my Bible so I don't get behind in my plan, you think, God is yearning to speak to me. Why don't I open his letter? What would it do for evangelism is rather than seeing it as our duty, we see God is yearning to have others in communion with Him. If you really think about it, it's an overwhelming concept. God yearns for you. I think if we get that down in our soul, it would change our lives. i got to admit to you, I'm not there yet. But it's a journey I'm looking forward to make. Now, at the risk of making you mad that I just didn't say this to begin with and sit down, let me summarize what I've been trying to say that I hear from this text. Bulletin.
The world hates you, always has, always will. Bulletin. Your response to the world and its hate is to go in peace, to love and serve the world. Bulletin. God yearns for you. If he was on Facebook, your picture would be on his profile page. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.